everybody. Welcome. Um, by the looks of you, some of you are really disappointed today. Others of you look uh, jubilant. Um, maybe just as a kind of uh, uh, an ecumenical venture, um, just find out whether someone's feeling uh, excited about the election result or desperate about the election result. Uh, so just talk to someone near you just for a minute. Just say hello. You have a conversation point already? Okay, let's test the mood. Did, did you hear from someone? Hands up if you heard from someone that was jubilant and excited. Hands up if you met someone that was moderately depressed. Hands up if you didn't bring up that subject, actually, because it was too bad. Um, well, not very far from here, some big decisions uh, were made, weren't they? And um, uh, when we come to pray in a minute, we're going to have to pray into that, aren't we? As a new government is formed, uh, we pray that they would make godly and wise uh, decisions. But um, it's not a million miles away from what we're talking about today. And today, um, uh, in a bit, we're going to meet Eugene Cho, a man passionate about social justice. And obviously, social justice has political connotations. So uh, it's significant that we're meeting here, right in the core of London, uh, right very close to where uh, our parliament will meet. So um, yeah, significant day. Um, Warm welcome to you. My name is Krish Kandaya, and uh, I'm the president for London School of Theology. Um, being president sounds very illustrious. And um, in the job description, it, I, I thought I might have got like uh, Air Force One, um, a White House. Uh, apparently, me and President Obama have a couple of things in common. One is our skin tone. We're not far off from one another. And the, the second is we both have a selfie stick, uh, which is <laughs> awesome. And, uh, but anyway, very warm welcome to you uh, to our Deo Gloria lecture. And uh, I think um, this is the first one I've been involved with, and we're delighted by uh, having you here. Um, we're going to start off with a bit of prayer. Uh, and then uh, Josh Bishop, uh, who is a first-year student at London School of Theology. Uh, nice. Let's do that again. Josh Bishop. He's going to be leading us in worship. But uh, to get us ready for that, why don't you, if you're able to, why don't you stand and uh, we will pray together. Just a bit of uh, scripture from the message translation. This was my uh, daily reading today from the book of Proverbs and uh, let me read it to you. This is Proverbs chapter 8. Oh, when your phone doesn't work, you have a funny day, don't you? Um, oh, it's just coming. Proverbs chapter 8, and it's Lady Wisdom speaking. Oh, come on. Sorry, I should have bought an, an iPhone, shouldn't I? I tried to be, you know, just, just different. All right, here is Proverbs chapter 8, verses 15 to 16. I am Lady Wisdom. With my help, leaders rule and lawmakers legislate fairly. With my help, governors govern, along with all in legitimate authority. Father God, on a momentous day in British politics, we ask that our government would lead with wisdom and compassion. We ask as faithful citizens of the kingdom, but also faithful citizens of the United Kingdom, you'd help us to play our part that we would pray for those in power, even if we didn't vote for them. That we would pray for them to um, honour you and to bring justice, mercy and compassion into public life. Father, we pray for those who are uh, out of a job. We pray for those who are uh, down in spirits because of what happened today. But Lord, we ask that still your name would be lifted up, that uh, honour would be brought to you. And Lord, we bring ourselves before you today and we recognise that you are the true king of the universe that it's to you we bow the knees, to you we offer up our lives. And right now we offer up our hearts and our mouths that we would sing you praise as you deserve. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Good evening. I'd like to join me as we, uh, we start by singing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise. 
love endures forever. Cause love endures forever. Forever. His love endures. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Forever. One more time, His love endures. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Forever. Forever, God. Forever, God is faithful. Forever, God is strong. Forever. God is with us forever. One more time, forever God is faithful. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. Forever. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Please have a seat. Well, just before uh, I introduce Eugene to you, I wanted to tell you about a few things that we're uh, running soon at the London School of Theology. The first thing uh, is an event called the Future Conference, um, Faith in the Future. And uh, for some reason, we as Christians are often looking back, looking back to a, a, a time in which Christianity was better. Um, in the church that I grew up, uh, that was around the 1800s. That was when uh, life was better. We remember the heyday of our church then. Uh, and then I went to uh, university and we look back to the 1980s. That was the time when stuff was really happening, the beginning of the kind of worship revolution. And um, some churches are looking back to the 1580s as the time uh, when things were better. But actually, as believers, we look forward to the future with great hope, don't we? that we believe that God's kingdom will come. We believe that we will see Jesus face to face. In all the shifts that are going around in our culture, we don't need to fear them, but we do need to engage with them. Uh, so we've got an amazing lineup of speakers uh, coming uh, to LST uh, in June, and uh, we'd love for you to be part of that. Um, one of the uh, key speakers is a guy called Leonard Sweet, uh, whose business card says the word futurologist. And um, that used to be, in the Old Testament words, prophet. Uh, but futurologist is his term. So um, he's going to be looking forward about the future of preaching. Uh, we're going to be hearing about the future of evangelism. We've got the head of um, the BBC Religion and Ethics talking about the future of uh, religious broadcasting. We've got people from Arosha coming, talking about the future of the planet. Uh, so it's going to be a really exciting conference. Book your space. Don't miss out. And uh, that's just a day conference, but if you're hungry for more of them, uh, more theology, then uh, we also have an amazing summer school coming up. And um, this is going to feature the talents uh, of Conrad Gempf, uh, who is just a unique teacher, uh, super enthusiastic person, uh, and he's going to be unpacking Mark's gospel for us uh, over the course of a week. Uh, we've also got Jeremy, who's our kind of key uh, worship and theology guy coming to speak. I'm going to be speaking about paradox uh, and the gospels, a really uh, inspiring, refreshing uh, time. So if you've already done some theology, this will be a great top up. If you've never done any theology, here's a little taster of what LST could be about. So we'd love to have you uh, with us for that. Um, this evening, we're running a little competition and um, we'd love you to be on Twitter. And uh, the hashtag for tonight is hash Deo Gloria, spelled D-E-O-G-L-O-R-I-A. And uh, I feel like I should have burst into a song then, shouldn't I? Do you remember that song? Who was that? Who used to say G-L-O-R-I-A? Gloria. No, I'm too old. Okay, that's fine. Uh, he also sang Brown Eyed Girl. 
Van Morrison, okay, fine. You guys, you're too young. All right, do I need to reference One Direction? Is that where I need to go? Anyway, if you, if you hash uh, Deo Gloria tonight, uh, the best tweet will win some prizes. So um, we're looking for insightful, theological, or funny, or of the moment tweets. And uh, I'll be tracking that during uh, Eugene's talk, and we'll present that prize at the end. And uh, if you don't participate, then I'll take the prizes home, which I'm very excited about. Brilliant. Well, uh, it's my delight to be able to introduce Eugene Cho to you. I first met Eugene uh, in Los Angeles at a conference called the Justice Conference, uh, which is an amazing event that took place in the Orpheum Theatre in downtown LA. And it was an incredible mix of, you know, cutting edge uh, worship and music, um, spoken word. I went to my first kind of spoken word event. Uh, I learned how to clap for a, a spoken word event. You don't use your fingers. It's all about kind of flicking your wrists. And um, there was a guy that was like Samuel L. Jackson, but speaking Christian truth. It was an amazing event and uh, probably the coolest event I've ever been to. And uh, headlining that event was Eugene uh, Cho. And uh, I met Eugene. We did a little interview together. Uh, it was uh, for a, a Christianity magazine. And uh, I met him in a kind of bar area that had been deserted. It looked like something from a cowboy movie. And uh, Eugene was very gracious, giving me some time. And uh, Eugene uh, founded, he's the visionary and uh, the founder of uh, an organization called One Day's Wages. And uh, I asked him, you know, what inspired him to do that. And um, he talked about just the need for radical generosity. And one of the things that uh, Eugene decided to do was he was asking everybody else to give one day's wages away to help fight extreme poverty. So he decided his family should think about giving a year's wages away, which was a pretty big ask. And uh, he, 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 got, he came to a point, I think he was uh, at home late one night and... Um, he realized he was going to fall short. He wasn't actually going to be able to get enough money together to give a year's wages away. So he decided to rent out his home. Okay, He was going to move out with his family, rent out his home, and that would make up the difference so he could give away a year's worth of wages. And uh, he just put it online, and he found someone that wanted to rent out his home. So he's kind of delighted, made the deal. And then he realized maybe that was a good time to talk to his wife about renting out his home. And the, the, the interesting detail here is Eugene's wife is a marriage counsellor, okay? So here is a brilliant test of her marriage counselling ability in her own marriage as her husband drops this amazing news that he's rented out the family home. They're going to move in with family members, him, his wife and his kids. And the fact that he is still married is a testimony to the grace of God in his life. And uh, if you need any more introduction to Eugene Cho, then there is a man of integrity, but there is a man who's living out his faith, and his marriage survived that, so that's brilliant. He's also uh, the founder of Quest Church in Seattle, uh, Washington, and he feels really at home in the UK. It was drizzling uh, when we uh, welcomed him into London, and uh, he, uh, Seattle is probably one of the rainiest places in London, so he feels very at home here. And uh, he is just a pastor with a vision uh, to bless his community, bless the arts community, uh, bless those that are ex experiencing extreme poverty. And so could I ask you to give a very warm welcome to Eugene Cho. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it again. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. All right, let's try that one more time. Good evening, everyone. Yes, if I could ask you for a favor, uh, I just got off the airplane about four hours ago. So I'm uh, struggling a little bit with energy just because it was a long flight from Los Angeles. And so I really would love to just have your energy and, and, and your support during our time together. Um, I am so honored to uh, spend the next um, couple hours with you. Uh, Chris, thank you so much again for the invitation and um, the introduction. I thought what I would do is uh, first just again thank all of you for being here on a Friday night. Uh, as this is my first time in the UK, uh, I'm so excited to be here. I asked some of my friends who are either from the UK or have visited numerous times for some advice about 
cultural nuances and adaptations just for my preparation. And they gave me a list of numerous things, including this one advice, say brilliant after everything someone says. <laughs> I, don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't care. I hope you say brilliant after this talk, every single one of you. Uh, before I embark on our talk for tonight, what I'd like to do is kind of give you a lay of the land of how I'd like to use the next hour or so. Uh, I have the opportunity to speak for about an hour and then we'll have some Q&A. Uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit more about uh, my background and my story so that you have an idea where I'm coming from. Because I know that for the majority of you, I'm probably an absolute stranger. I then want to speak to you about three things, if I may. I want to speak to you about the necessity or the essential theology of justice. So I want to speak to you about the theology of justice. And then I want to speak to you about the modern necessity of justice. And then finally, I want to speak to you about the dangers of justice. Those three things. But if you could just join me in a word of prayer, let's pray together. God, thank you again for this opportunity to be together tonight. I thank you for my sisters and brothers that we can gather in this space to sing these songs of worship. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In a short bit, I'm going to read for you a passage from the book of Amos in the Old Testament. So even right now, you're welcome to check out Amos chapter 5 and park your Bible or your apps on that particular chapter. So uh, as Chris said, my name is Eugene. I have been married to my wife, Minhi, for 18 years. It is true. I am her inspiration of becoming a marriage therapist. Uh, we have three children. Uh, they're turning 17, 15, and 13, or 12, in the coming months. If you know my children and their names, you'll have a good idea about my worldview or some of my biases, if you will. For example, all of our children have both biblical names that also have pop culture references. So both of those really matter to me. I love the scriptures, and I also love how the truth of scriptures can engage our larger culture, which is the reason why it was very important to me to name our children with both biblical names with pop culture references. For example, our oldest, her name is Jubilee. Jubilee from the Old Testament, from Leviticus, God's promise every 50 years is beautiful. Jubilee is also an X-Men character for the one of you that might be a fan of X-Men, wrong crowd. Um, our second child, her name is Trinity. Don't judge us, but it is from the film Matrix. She's not yet seen the film. And of course, Trinity is a great theological truth of God's identity. Lastly, my son, I confess his name is my favorite. His name is Jedi. Jedi from Star Wars. And Jedi, you probably don't know this, but George Lucas was deeply influenced by his Judeo-Christian background. Jedi comes from Solomon's Hebrew name, which is Jedidiah, which means the chosen beloved, the chosen one. So even though Jedi is 12 years old, we still have our lightsaber matches on a regular basis. It always ends up where I chop off his arm, we reconcile, I then say, I'm your father. We do this every single week, even though he's still 12 years old. He doesn't want to do it anymore, but I still love it. <laughs> You're probably wondering, how is it possible that you convinced your wife, Eugene, to name your son Jedi. Teach us, O Yoda. <laughs> well, if I may, I'd love to share the story with you. I've learned over 18 years of marriage and being married to a marriage therapist that free will, choice, is one of God's greatest gifts to humanity. 
So anytime someone feels like their back is against the wall, uh, fights or revolutions will take place. So I went to my wife when we found out we were having a son for our third, and I said, Minhi, I would like to name our son Jedi. She then said, no. <laughs> Being a true believer of Star Wars, I then went, I would like to name our son Jedi. <laughs> for half of you who are Star Wars fans. She said, no. We actually thought about this because names are really important. You were given a name for a particular reason. And so after some months of wrestling with it, I finally went to my wife and I said, Minhi, I am so sorry that I cornered you into the wall. It is only fair, only right, and only just that you, the mother of this child, you're the one carrying this baby in your womb, you should choose our son's name. And she was so happy. So I then said, here's your choice. <laughs> Someone here is having ideas right now. I said, Minhi, it's Jedi or Frodo. One of these two <laughs> you must choose. I am so glad that she chose wisely, because I don't know about you, Frodo Cho sounds not very holy to me, but that's just me. I was six years old when I immigrated to the United States, and after a week after immigrating from Seoul, South Korea, I took the public bus to Sherman Elementary School. So even as I speak right now, there isn't a day, certainly not a week that goes by when I'm not reminded of my story as an immigrant. It's a very prevalent part of who I am. Both my parents were born in what is now called North Korea. Back then, there was only one country, and I can probably speak at length about this, but my great-grandfather was one of the first people in his small village outside of a city called Pyongyang, which is now the capital of North Korea. He was one of the first people to come to know Jesus. And as a result, my great-grandmother and the whole household came to faith. I suspect, like many of us, when he came to believe in Jesus, that he assumed that there would be blessings in following Jesus, the blessings came very differently because as a result of his faith, he experienced, the whole household experienced intense persecution. So intense that in the middle of the night, my grandfather wakes up my father and says, it's time. And so in the middle of the night, much of their family packed up what they could on their backs. And my father, as a six-year-old boy, he tells me this crazy story of carrying one of his cousins who was three years old on his back as they're fleeing away from a government that was becoming incredibly, incredibly demonic. To this day, there are times I question why it is that some of our family members are still in North Korea. But when I think back at the story of my parents and of my uh, fellow country, I am oftentimes inspired and moved by the fact that as often as we criticize missions and missionaries, and it's not to say that there aren't things for us to criticize and to examine, I am also simultaneously incredibly moved by the faith of men and women. These white missionaries from the United Kingdom, from the United States, who got on boats and they sailed across the world, and they came not only preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but they came to embody the whole gospel. And what I mean by the whole gospel is not just merely words and proclamation of the good news, but it's what happens when you truly believe in that good news. It alters and changes the very way that we live our lives. Now, most folks might not know this, but it was these early missionaries who came and they not only came and helped translate the scriptures into his native language, but they also helped build the first schools. They helped build the first orphanages, the first hospitals. They were out on the streets with other believers, local believers, protesting against injustices and fighting for fairness. That was a story I only recently had heard in my 20s and 30s once I became more familiar with my background and my family understanding. It made sense to them. Sometimes I wonder why it doesn't always make sense to us. This concept of the whole gospel. Now I want to read for you a scripture passage from Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, and I'm going to read for you the translation from the message, listen for the word of God. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Now, I'm not sure if that sounds harsh. I am reading that prophetic word from Amos not necessarily as a word for you. This is not me passive aggressively criticizing your churches or your theological school. I want to give you a little context to this. Once you understand the context of where this passage is coming from, it'll make dramatic sense. I'm not sure how much you know about Amos, but Amos is not one of your more popular prophets. At my church, I asked my congregation, how many of you have read through Amos? And maybe 1% of hands went up. I then asked, how many of you have heard a sermon based on the book of Amos? And maybe 5% of hands went up. So here's a couple things, just in case you might not know much about Amos, or if you need to be refreshed about Amos, to help you get a little bit more glimpse of this context here. Amos was not born a prophet. In fact, for all of us, we probably have our own agendas in life, and somehow through various circumstances and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, God begins to give us vision for our lives. Amos was born in a small town called Tekoa, which was about 10 miles probably from Jerusalem. So he's born in a very small town in Tekoa, and he had two jobs. He was a farmer and a shepherd, which basically meant back then you were considered on the bottom rung of a social ladder of significance. Now, even in our world today, even though we don't necessarily verbalize it out loud, we do have a social hierarchy. A CEO, for example, is considered significant and valuable and maybe more worthy. I'm telling you right now, if you had children during the time of Amos, you would tell your kids, don't be like Amos. His job wasn't very well revered. As part of his job, he specialized in something called sycamore fig trees, which produced the fruit, and because he was a farmer, he basically was a small business owner. He would go to Tekoa, to their uh, farmer's market, if you will, and see if there was a demand for his product. But Tekoa was so small that what he did is that he realized he had to go from village to village to village. 
And it's that story. He travels from the southern part of this kingdom to the northern kingdom. And as he travels, he begins to see the cities. He begins to see the country. He begins to see the state of the country, if you will. And he's appalled. He's appalled because through his work and his vocation, he begins to see injustices. He begins to see exploitation and oppression. And what angers him the most is that he actually begins to see people who were professing a belief and a worship of Yahweh, they were the ones who were often exploiting the poor. And it was a strong disconnect for him. And what angered him even more so was that these religious people would then use erroneous, distorted theology to explain why the poor people were poor and why they were cursed by God. And it disturbs him so much that God begins to speak to him in dreams and revelations And it's in that context that he goes to this temple called the Bethel Temple where you have religious leaders just like yourself. And God speaks this prophetic word to them. And I want you to know God or Amos is not saying that our churches, our buildings, our programs, our logos, our theological institutions, God's not saying that these things are wrong in themselves But what he is saying is that if we exit these doors and we've sung these songs, we've listened to the word read and a scripture scripture read and a word proclaimed, if we exit these doors and what we're talking about and learning and proclaiming with our lips and our hearts, if these things don't impact the way that we love our spouses, our children, our parents, our friends, our neighbors, our enemies, if it doesn't impact the way that we engage the marketplace of work and vocation, if it's not impacting and changing our lives, then what Amos is saying is, This is really all a show. It's a sham. And do you know what happens if you're committed to doing a show, then your priorities is what? You try to put on the best show that you can. And so God begins to speak through the prophet Amos to say to these religious leaders, you say one thing, you sing one thing, you believe in one thing, and yet when you exit these temple doors, you're the very ones who are exploiting and oppressing and taking advantage of the poor. That disconnect. So justice matters. In fact, I would tell you today that as I speak to you about justice, I would contend with you that our theology of justice is absolutely essential and integral, which is the reason why the first thing that I want to speak to you about is this theology of justice. Now, oftentimes, I don't know if you're like this. I know that we have many students from LST, and maybe there aren't. But I know that in my church or in other churches that I visit, when people hear the word theology, many often cringe. Ooh, it's the T word. As if it's from a far removed ivory tower with absolutely no connection with real life on the streets. Now, I don't know if you think or you're inclined in this way. The truth is, whether we use the word theology or not, everyone has a theology. Everyone. That is to say, everyone has a social construct and understanding of God. But if our theology is healthy, it not only shapes how we think, 
it ought to shape how we live our very lives. Yes, healthy theology impacts the streets and not just our churches because it is truly incarnational. So theology really matters. So why does justice matter? We do justice, we pursue justice, we engage justice. The why is absolutely essential. Now, I don't want to pretend to know what the state of affairs might be in the United Kingdom, at least in North America, and I was just in Australia as well. There is a lot of talk about justice. A lot of talk. So some who I've spoken to, they've asked me, do you think people are doing this because it's glamorous or trendy or faddish? Why is it that there are more talks and books and conferences and resources and classes about justice? Well, yes, you may be partially right about some of these things, but I want you to realize that for us as followers of Jesus, the reason why justice matters is because, very simply, it's biblical. Period. You cannot read the scriptures without sensing God's heart for justice. The list of scriptures that speak to God's love for justice goes on and on and on. There are over 200 references in the Old Testament that speak simply about justice. My favorite is Isaiah 61, 8, where it declares, I, the Lord, love justice. Some may push back and say, well, justice is not discussed as often or in that much prevalence in the New Testament. And the reason why is because Jesus embodied justice. Rather than looking at it from a trend or glamorous or a political agenda, the reason why justice matters is because it is biblical, it's not peripheral, it's part of the centrality of God's story. Another way that I like to tell people is that it's not a wardrobe that you put on and off, in season or off season, it's the very nature and character of God. It's who God is. Now, I know it's not the best example, but let me give you an attempt of an example to see if this makes sense. Imagine if there's a box here on this podium. And let's just argue for the sake of this example that this box is God. Now, I know you can't put God in a box, but let's just do it. Here's a box and it's God. If I were to extract the character of love outside of God's character, that would be nonsensical. Because how can we speak of God and God's character without knowing God's love? It's impossible. You would tell Chris, do not invite this heretic again. If we were to extract grace out of God's character, certainly the only reason why you and I are here is because of God's grace. Or what if we were to remove holy or holiness out of God's character? You can't. Even though God's holiness is not a very popular subject, you cannot understand God's character without knowing a glimpse of his holiness. This is one of the reasons why the psalmist, in his human finitude, trying to grasp the infinitude of God, trying to grasp the holiness of God, the psalmist can only proclaim and exclaim, you are holy, holy, holy. So my question to those who often push back about the significance of justice is what happened, particularly among evangelical Christians, 
that we've somehow extracted justice out of God's character so that whenever we bring it up, it is a political agenda. This is a bad social justice concept. It's a tool of the culture and society, and it's not biblical. What happened? There are times, at least in the United States, when I'm speaking about a biblical, theological understanding of justice. Those who are perturbed by it, they often say, Eugene, you're just an angry socialist, possible quasi-Christian. And I'll say, what just happened? This is why having an important, critical, theological, biblical understanding of justice is so important as we navigate what it means to be faithful as followers of Jesus. Now, I get it. I'm speaking to theological students and faculty. Surely I am speaking to the choir as pastors and leaders and seminarians and theologians or simply as followers of Christ, who among us do not love justice? Now, don't raise your hand, but if I were to ask you a rhetorical question, who here doesn't like justice? And by chance, if someone raised their hands, we know what we will be thinking inside. What a jerk. Because it's contrary to our understanding of who God is. And that's for anything that reflects God's character. If I said, who here doesn't like generosity? Who here doesn't like mercy? Who here doesn't like whatever the phrase might be? None of us would raise our hands. This is where we need to be very honest with ourselves. Maybe the truth is that we are more in love, more enamored with the idea of justice than actually pursuing justice. Does that make sense? That we're more in love with the idea of mercy or forgiveness. C.S. Lewis once said, everyone loves the idea of forgiveness until they have someone to forgive. Or perhaps because we do love the idea of justice, maybe it's more accurate to say we are more in love with the idea of justice until there's an actual personal cost to us. And then we back away. Maybe we're more in love with the idea of following Jesus than actually following Jesus until there's a cost to us. This is why I think having a sober, important, theological, faithful understanding of Jesus and discipleship is so important, meaning there is always a cost to following Jesus. There is a cost to pursuing justice. Maybe some of you are missing what I'm trying to say. Maybe it's my jet lag. Let me give you an example. I love exercise. You probably couldn't tell by my physique. Now, let me be more honest. I love the idea of exercise. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to just be very honest open and honest here. I'm 44 years old. I've ruptured both of my Achilles. I've torn both of my knees. I've separated my left shoulder a few times. And so it's been a while since I've been active. I had a gym membership for 10 years. And over those 10 years, I went to the gym once. It's a horrible lesson on stewardship, <laughs> but just edit that out from the video. 
For 10 years, I paid $9.95 and I went to the gym once. I have a treadmill in the basement of our home. It looks nice. This is sad, but it's true. I subscribe to two fitness and health magazines. They go straight to the recycling bin. What I'm trying to tell you is that you can read about exercise, you can, you can have a membership to an exercise gymnasium, you can do all of these things. Do you know how many calories you lose thinking about exercise? It's not a trick question. We can sing about justice. We can theologize about justice. We can write about justice. We could do liturgy about justice. We could have conferences about justice. It is entirely different than pursuing justice and living justly in our lives. That means the same God who has been revealing over the course of human history, this God is still speaking to the world today. It is the question, not is God speaking, do we have the courage to obey? One of my favorite verses comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 4, where it reads very simply, Jesus had to go through Samaria. The reason why that verse is so radical is because no one walked through Samaria for right reasons or for legitimate reasons because it was dangerous, it was combative, and there was so much tension between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. And so what people did when they had to travel from the southern region to the northern region is that they always traveled east at all costs to avoid Samaria. They traveled east, they actually crossed a river, the Jordan River, and they headed up north. This trip took about three to four times the length of going from a straight line from point A to point B. But the scripture says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. In other words, what I'm telling you is that we can talk about Samaria, we can discuss Samaria, we can pray about Samaria, we can theologize about Samaria. It's an entirely different thing to walk through Samaria. I don't know what it's like here in the UK. I'm sure it's not in the same intensity. But race relations in the United States is incredible. Incredibly intense, as you probably have gathered from watching news of Ferguson and Brooklyn and Baltimore. And it's incredibly painful. And it's painful because the church, oftentimes, we like to talk a nice game about reconciliation, but we're choosing not to walk through Samaria. This is really my confession. It's my confession that I am more in love with the idea of doing good things than actually doing the things that God's placed upon my heart. Chris earlier mentioned this book called Overrated, and it's not a guru book of here's seven things you need to do. It's a very painful confession that I've had to wrestle with for a long time. Because do you know why? Because after a while, when you're a preacher, when you're a teacher, when you're a blogger, when you're a writer, when you're a speaker, over the years, it's really easy to fall in love with ideas than to actually pursue those very convictions that God's placed upon our hearts. Now, I hope that makes sense. We live in a culture today, because of social media in particular, where I think we're more enamored by the projection of certain ideas or images than I think living it out on our own when no one's watching us. Now, I do this, you probably do this as well, but social media is not necessarily real life. 
Like I choose on my Instagram to highlight certain things about my great life. Better be jealous. And maybe you have friends like this. I have friends, for example, that are foodies and they take all of these different angles over the same food and it drives me nuts. And I always leave the comment, just eat your food. <laughs> if you use that, please quote me. <laughs> so my wake-up experience, because my Amos experience, and my prayer is that all of us are on a journey. So all of us, may we have our Amos experiences. For me, it happened on several levels. I'll just share one story with you. It was when I was traveling to a country called Burma, otherwise known as Myanmar. Now, to be honest with you, I hadn't really learned much about this country. The only thing that I knew prior to going on this trip was knowing that a band called U2 wrote a song called Walk On as a tribute song to a woman named Aung San Suu Kyi, the democratically elected president who was under house arrest for a good chunk of 20 years. So we trekked into parts of Burma that foreigners are not allowed to enter in even to this day. Burma has opened up tremendously in the last 10 years, but there are still places that foreigners and media are not allowed to enter in because horrible things are taking place. So about eight years ago, I had a chance with a couple friends doing research. We entered into the jungles of Burma to a village called 71. It was given a number because they had to constantly move. And so these villages simply had a number. I was invited to visit a school. And there was a makeshift school in the jungle, so I need you to use your imagination. Imagine 15 chairs, 15 desks. These are chairs and desks that people have made out of resources in the jungles. There's a chalkboard that's scarred by overusage. It's a classroom for first to fifth graders. So along with three or four of my colleagues, other pastors from around the United States, we walk into this classroom and I did not want to be that uh, Western guy that was too demonstrative with opinions and thoughts. But I walked in and I saw something and it is one of the most hideous, disgusting things I have ever seen with my own eyes. And I think I could not help but respond physically in some way as I'm listening to my host I'm looking at this poster that was taped onto this chalkboard eventually my host sensing that I was disturbed he says to me in his broken English he says Reverend Cho Reverend Cho come closer come closer he kneels down and there's this poster the size of this pulpit now you're probably wondering what's on this poster it was a poster a collage of photos of women men and children with missing body parts and blood oozing out of them this is a classroom for first to fifth graders He points to the bottom roll of greenish contraptions and he says, these are landmines. We must teach children avoid landmines. And it was that day meeting some of the parents and children with missing body parts who survived that gave me my Amos moment. Now I want to show you this picture. I had a chance to meet a family, one of the leaders of this village here. And when I met them, I was surprised because he, I asked him, what's difficult in your village? And I'm not suggesting that everything was difficult. They had so much courage and so much faith. About 60% of this particular ethnic people called the Korean people 
are Christians. Well, knowing that I had visited a school, he said, paying teachers' salaries hard. Now, I'm a really inquisitive guy, so I asked instantaneously, uh, Sir, I'm curious, how much are their salaries? He sticks out four fingers like this, and he says, $40 U.S. So I then said, per day? And he literally laughed at me. Maybe he thought I was joking. So I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you mean $40 a week? He again laughed at me. And he said, no. I was shocked. So I then said, I'm sorry, did you mean $40 a month? This time he stopped laughing, his face turned stoic. I think I've really irritated him. And he shooks, shakes his head once more and says, no. I was afraid to ask the next level. I'm sorry, sir. Did, did you mean... F My mind is being blown here. Did you mean $40 a year? And he finally said yes. Now, I share that not to try to manipulate guilt or shame upon any of us, but simply to communicate that even right now, in 2015, to illuminate the disparity of wealth and resources in the world. It is stunning for me to think that even in our world today, while there's certainly been amazing advances, we live in a world today where approximately 14,000 children under the age of five die every single day. I don't want to swear, but if that does not tick you off, something is wrong with the spirit within us. In our world today of so much resources, 750 million people don't have access to clean water. But 36 million people are caught in some form of human trafficking and slavery in the world. The number of refugees impacted by Syria has grown and ballooned to nearly 12 million people. Now, I'm not suggesting that you and I can fix all of these things. But what I am telling you is that we cannot ignore and just look the other way. I love these challenging words from William Wilberforce from your country who once said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. In part, that was the story of one day's wages. I came back home, and if I can share with you the picture of my family, I came back home and shared this with my wife and kids, and so we spent some time praying, this is my family, we look this good all the time, this is not even photoshopped. <laughs> Clearly this was some years ago, but we spent some time wrestling with this and praying, God, what would you have us do? And to be honest, on my mind it was, I think I'm going to give a sermon. Maybe I'll write a blog post. Maybe I'll tweet some stuff. Not that those things aren't actions in themselves. We just have to be careful that social media is not the totality of how we respond to God's convictions. Now, I say this not to sound boastful. So I would like to ask for your grace because we have received our share of criticism. But after praying, we were convicted to give up a year's wages. 
my wife, God bless Minhee, she was ready to go. It took me three years to come to peace with this conviction. And during that three years, it meant simplifying our lives, selling off stuff. It meant basically having some very difficult and honest conversations. And one of the things that I learned during this time is that even as a follower of Christ and even as a pastor and a leader and a theologian, I have been seduced by the popular mantra in our culture that I don't have enough. I have a friend, a congregant at my church who's a marketing guru slash expert, and he tells me, Pastor Eugene, marketing 101, what they tell you is if you convince people that they don't have enough, they'll just keep pursuing and buying everything that's before them to fill that void. It was during this time I realized, and full disclosure, my, my salary as a pastor $68,000 a year. I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but that's just my salary. $68,000 a year, and if I'm honest, there are times I think my church should pay me more. Just being very bluntly honest. I'll make sure they don't get this link. Now, you might not know this, but $68,000 might not seem like a lot, especially in comparison to some of the world's richest people. Bill Gates, my neighbor in Seattle, not literally my neighbor, but he lives in Seattle. He is the wealthiest person in the world. Did you know that with my salary of $68,000 a year, that puts me among the world's richest people? My rank is 52nd richest person in the world. You better respect me. I spin my rims. That might not sound very impressive. You're laughing. You're mocking me. It actually puts me in the top 0.86 percentile of wealth in the world. Maybe in comparison to others, but I tell you, you should not leave these doors not knowing how blessed we are. So why the necessity of justice in our world today? Well, I want to rush through a few things in our limited time, but there's a few reasons why, particularly today, justice must be critical for us as followers of Christ. One, because there's injustice to fight against. That alone, there's injustice. There are people living in exploitation and oppression. So for us as followers of Christ, we have to care. One of the best and most consistent questions that I get from people is, uh, Eugene, how do you wrap your mind around so much brokenness in this world? And having spent some time in my life in some of the most horrific situations, where I've seen people literally eat mud to fill the hunger pangs of their tummy having spent times in brothels and countries to look at women and at times most likely girls under the age of 17 with simply numbers on them. How do you wrap your mind around so much brokenness? I don't have an answer that will satisfy you, but I do believe it begins and it stays with our hearts. Meaning, you got to care. Give a damn. That's one reason why the necessity of justice matters so much. Here's two more reasons, if I can, quickly. Because it's part of our discipleship. See, this is what 
irks me sometimes when people somehow compartmentalize justice apart from the larger character of God because when you do this, we're not experiencing the full formation of how we grow in our discipleship. As leaders, as followers of Christ, discipleship ought to matter to us. So when we pursue justice, it helps us to learn more about the heart and about the character of God. Thus, it's discipleship forming. Here's the third reason about the necessity of justice in the modern world today. It's a little odd, but I believe it to be very important to you especially, living in London, living in the UK, living in a post-Christendom world. Justice is important today for the reasons that I mentioned, but I also believe it is one of the most significant methods and expressions of evangelism. Now, let me explain this. I live in Seattle. Seattle, I would say, is probably part of a region in the Pacific Northwest that is often labeled hostile to the gospel. It not only boasts the lowest church attendance, the highest rate of pastor leadership turnover, it's often known as the city of PKs, which means pastor killers, and it's true. It is a city that has a deep, deep, distrust and anger against organized religion. And what I've learned over the years is that people will not speak to me if they find out that I'm a pastor. So I have to often tell people because I need social interaction, when they ask me, so what do you do? I tell people I'm a teacher. And they'll go, oh, that's quite interesting. What do you teach? I go, I teach uh, spirituality. Oh, that sounds really interesting. What kind of spirituality do you teach? I go, "Uh, Yeshua. They're like, wow, that sounds really fascinating. What is this Yeshua all about? And at that point, they're obligated to at least listen a little bit about Yeshua. I've learned over the years... In the 18 years that I've lived in Seattle, and I don't know if this is the same for you, but this is my experience. In 18 years, I have never met a single person that has not heard something about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying it's correct. It's often distorted, manipulated, filled with angry lens. But I'm realizing that my dogma, my doctrine, my Schleiermacher, my Kierkegaard, my Bart won't necessarily fascinate them towards Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting that your LST degree is useless in society. I'm just saying that cultural exegesis is really, really important. You don't know how often I want to just quote Schleiermacher. I just can't. which is the reason why I've said his name twice already here. (laughs) Justice has the ability to pique people's interest, to fascinate people, not just by what we believe, but the credibility and the weight of what we believe. Because if we believe in a gospel that also cares for justice and mercy and compassion, and hear this, but also for those that don't look like us. See, for many of us, we talk about justice issues because they're personal, because it impacts someone that looks like us. Justice I believe, can be a powerful opportunity for evangelism as we fascinate people to the gospel of Christ. The dangers of justice. This is where I think it's so easy for us to be 
overrated, if you will. Because if I can just point to maybe three simple things among many that I can highlight, here's three simple things that sometimes concern me about me and perhaps about you. The first would be the fact that we are products of a culture that is about the fast food and the fast results. When discipleship and the pursuit of justice is about a marathon. It's about a long, long marathon. And so as a result, what I see in myself and in my peers and in my church, in my congregation of lots of young people, is that our church, we have a lot of young people at our church. About 70% of our church are in their 20s and 30-somethings. And if I can boast about my congregation, they are brilliant. Brilliant. They're smart. Seattle is considered the smartest city in America based upon the number of degrees that are represented in the city. It's amazing to me the ideas I often tell my congregation and our culture today, I would say that this culture, this generation is probably one of the most brilliant, creative generations in the history of the world because of all the resources that we have. I mean, we'll talk about some stuff with my congregation, and in a week, they'll create this amazing app. It's amazing. But where they excel in creativity, my concern is that we lack tenacity in our culture today. We lack perseverance. If we believe God has called us to certain convictions, then we have to believe that God will help us through if we remain steadfast and tenacious in our pursuit of the things that God's called us to. It's always, it always, it's, always amazes me how we can so eloquently use God language to speak how God brings us into something and how God also takes us out of something. My parents, who are still alive, my father is turning 80. And my mother, who's a little over 70. About 14 and a half years ago, I was uh, planting a church with my wife called Quest Church. And long story short, things did not go as we had planned. And what that meant was uh, the church plant just didn't really happen for the first year. Realized that I had no job realized that we couldn't make our payments, realized that after looking for jobs for eight months, learned that my master's of divinity degree literally was useless to society. Stay encouraged. <laughs> and my parents were very concerned because, to be honest with you, they did not immigrate to this country and strive and suffer for their youngest son to be unemployed. So that was really difficult for them. They committed to prayer for us. After eight months, I finally landed a job. It wasn't what I envisioned. I'm not saying that that job was beneath me. It was the most challenging time because it was the last thing on my mind. I got a job working as a janitor at a bookstore called Barnes & Noble. So I would wake up in the morning at 6 a.m. before it opened at 9 a.m. to go, and I was the one cleaning 40,000 square feet of space. One day, my mother flew up from San Francisco to Seattle about a week after I started this job, and she, like she does every single morning, she's at the dining table, she's praying. Now, I don't know if you know much about Korean spirituality, but... There's something about Korean moms that wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning to pray and to sing off-key. <laughs> I'm just going to say it because she'll never listen to this video. And so she's in the kitchen and she's praying. And as I'm kind of tiptoeing downstairs, she says, Eugene, no 어디 가니? Eugene, where are you going? Now, I didn't tell her that I got a job because of my pride. Yuzuna, no, 어디 가니? 
Where are you going? Yeah. 어머니 저 일가요. Well, mother, I'm uh, going to work. And then she says the question I was hoping she would not ask. She goes, 어떤 일? What kind of work? So I go, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> wow, you understand Korean so well. It's the smartest school ever. Yeah, j o Ah, uh, yeah, 저, yeah, 어머니 저 um, 청소해요. I'm uh, working as a custodian. My mother hears this. She gets up from the dining table. If you if you were to visit Quest Church right now, you would instantaneously recognize my mother because she's the one that walks like this. After years of hard work and labor, of not having insurance, you'll see her walking like this. And so that morning, I say I'm a custodian. She gets up and she's walking towards me, and I am genuinely scared because my mother is a disciplinarian. She walks towards me, and I'm not quite sure what she's going to do. I'm prepared for a For, for a fight, and she, she walks towards me, and she actually walks past me. I have no idea what she's, what she's doing. <laughs> she walks past me. She goes to the closet. She opens the door. She puts on her jacket. And I'll never forget this. She says to me, u n g j i n a k a c h i gaja. Eugene, let's go together. I'll help you. That's the kind of tenacity that we need. Last thing that I'll share, and uh, we'll have some time for Q&A. I'm sorry for going a little long. I'm concerned about one of the biggest dangers of justice work, and it's this. We cannot reduce people into projects. Jesus does some amazing, amazing, miraculous things. Like if he had his own LinkedIn profile and he listed all of his miracles, we would say, wow, quite impressive. For me, as I examine the Gospels and the life of Jesus, the thing that still compels me and fascinates me about Jesus, yes, it's the miracles, yes, their teachings, but I am so compelled that a person who was hurried and pursued, that Jesus always decided to pause and to look at people in the eyes. Always. Always. Now, you know, when you look at someone in the eyes, I don't have the time to lock eyes with every single person, but when you look at someone in the eyes, what you're basically saying is, I see you. I see you. You're of value and worth and dignity for us as followers of Christ. When we see someone, we are proclaiming that you too are created in the image of God. That's powerful. Remember that woman who's been bleeding internally for many years and in her mind, she's worming through the crowd. She's thinking in her mind, if only I can touch Jesus, I will be healed. She touches Jesus and she's healed. I love that story. It gets crazy because Jesus asks, in my opinion, one of the most ridiculous questions when he says, who touched me? Why is it ridiculous? Because you're Jesus. Jesus. Jesus knew, but he wanted to grasp that moment as a teaching moment to give people a glimpse of the kingdom of God. We 
we cannot reduce people into projects. The homeless is not your project. People that are trafficked should not just be seen only through a singular lens, which oftentimes feeds our Christian messianic savior complex. When I was in college three years ago, thank you. <laughs> when I was in college, uh, I was a double major. I was a psychology major and a theater major, and I was horrible in theater. I had a stuttering problem during middle school and high school. I was voted the shyest person in middle school, and I realized that I needed to do something. So I did the scariest thing that came to my mind, and that was audition for a play. So I loved it so much that in college, I double majored, didn't graduate with a degree in theater, but I was cast for two plays only. In one of those plays, I was playing a homeless person. The director, after rehearsals one day, comes up to me. He was known to be very blunt and brash, and he just railed into me. He said, Eugene, you are horrible. I was like, geez. Because Eugene, you're jumping on lines. You don't understand your person's story or narrative. If you're serious about your craft, I want you to take a week off from rehearsals, go out into the streets, and just live out there, and then come back. So I took my craft seriously, so I took his challenge. Didn't survive for an entire week, but for four nights and five days, I went to San Francisco on Market Street, the busiest street, the financial district, and I parked myself in front of a department store called Macy's, and I was just there for about five days, four nights, and I still remember to this day. I remember I dressed a certain way because of the bad stereotypes I had in my mind. But what I remember to this day, on occasion, there were people who would, out of their kindness, out of pity, I'm not sure, they would toss their coin my way. But what I remember to this day that I will never forget, because I've never had that similar experience, is that over those five days and four nights, literally thousands of people walked past me. Not a single person would look at me in the eyes. And I've never felt so invisible, so insignificant. And I wonder if Mother Teresa was correct when she said the greatest disease in the Western world today is loneliness. Now I know why we do it sometimes. It's because we think we have to fix it all or we can't do anything. And I'm telling you right now, justice begins when we treat one another as people created in the image of God, and that begins when you see them, when we look at them. One of my favorite novelists, her name is Chimamande Ngozi Adichie. She's a Nigerian novelist who is also well known for a talk that she gave at an event called TED. If you haven't seen it, I would challenge you to see this talk called The Danger of a Single Story. And what she says is this. She says, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. Stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. This explains to me one of the most powerful personal letters I've ever received from some friends that do work in South Africa. It goes like this. Eugene, we know you run a development and humanitarian organization. Thank you for your work, but as you share the stories 
of difficulties and pain, don't forget to share the stories of beauty, hope, courage, and love. Please be responsible in your storytelling. Please tell your Western countries that the whole of Africa is not dangerous, warmongers, child soldiers, starving, helpless, and desperate. Please tell your folks that while we appreciate love and prayers and support, we are not in need of the Western white saviors or, for that matter, Western Asian saviors. I was so proud to be included in this letter. He goes on to say, we are proud, we are beautiful, we have a history, we have beautiful stories and songs. We are not perfect, but we too are created in the wondrous image of God. Perhaps the most dangerous and the best part about doing justice work might be this, is that we realize that we actually are the ones that need to be changed. It's so easy for us to say, God, will you move this mountain? And we forget or neglect the possibility that we actually might be that mountain. Going back to that story of 15 years ago, I was unemployed, we were without insurance, and so my wife and I, and at that time, our two children, uh, our two daughters, we were on something called food stamps. I'm not sure if you know what that is. Uh, the program, the name of it is called WIC in our state. And to be honest with you, as a pastor and leader, I have spoken about this, talked about this. But I had never built relationship with people who actually survived on food stamps. And there came a time, not because out of choice, but because out of circumstances, because the church planning thing did not work out. I was unemployed for a while. I remember going to the WIC office for the very first time, and I was so nervous. And the folks that were there, there was about maybe 10 or 12 people also in the offices waiting for their numbers to be called. Some of them must have sensed I was really nervous. Because a couple of them came to me and they said, are you okay? And I explained to them that I was here for the very first time. And these were fresh, recent immigrants that we sometimes cast in that singular lens. And when I remember that day, I'll never forget this, there were these migrant Hispanic people, there were these new refugees that had come in from parts of Africa and Southeast Asia, and the next thing you know, seven of them had laid their hands on me when they heard that I was an aspiring church planter, and they were praying for me at the WIC offices. And it reminds us how important this is because we ourselves need to be changed. I'm going to stop there. I think we're going to show a quick video and then I think Chris will facilitate a Q&A. Are we ready to show this video? It's great, thank you. My name is Eugene Cho. My wife Minhee and I have been married nearly 20 years. We have three children. Minhee's a therapist and I'm a pastor. We're not rock stars or celebrities or millionaires. We're just average folk trying to live lives of faith, hope, and love. In the fall of 2009, our family started a humanitarian organization called One Day's Wages, a grassroots movement of people, stories, and actions to alleviate extreme global poverty. In our world today, there are still 1.2 billion people that live in extreme poverty. The issues are complex and numerous, but the experts agree that we can end extreme poverty in our lifetime. To start ODW, we honored a pledge to donate a year's wages. To make that possible, we spent three years saving, simplifying, and selling stuff we just didn't need. 
In giving, we then invited and inspired people around the world to consider donating one day's wages. You see, one day's wages is the equivalent of 0.4% of one's annual salary. But for those living in extreme poverty, the impact can be significant. And our pledge to you remains very simple. Number one, 100% of your donations go to carefully vetted projects and organizations. And two, it's never glamorous, simple, or sexy, but we'll prove to you how your funds will be used to empower people to lift themselves out of poverty. We've been so humbled and amazed that with your help, we've raised nearly $2 million. Now, how is this possible? Well, we're a grassroots movement. Over 10,000 people from over 40 countries have joined and given. Thousands of women, men, and children have started birthday idea and group campaigns to activate their friends to join. For example, Wiley bicycles across America, 3,200 miles. Angie, a mother of two, shaved her head. Darren completed a triathlon. Esther ran a marathon. 18 friends climbed a very big mountain. Songwriters and bands and hip hop artists and break dancers joined. Companies, small businesses, churches, schools joined the movement of One Day's Wages. Through your help, here's a glimpse of our impact together. We help construct Far Western Nepal's most comprehensive microbiology lab. 20 Iraqi children received life-saving heart surgeries, and local Iraqi medical professionals received 5,000 hours of training so that they might perform future surgeries. About 1,200 people in Nanplim, Haiti now have access to clean water. We helped build a maternity ward and laboratory in Mali. This beautiful little girl was the first baby born in this clinic. Her name is Diakine. Let's be honest, we can't change the entire world, but that's not an excuse to do nothing. We can't change the entire world, but we can impact the world of many and in the process, be changed ourselves. Join the movement of One Day's Wages. I think after hearing Eugene's inspirational talk, we need to give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. So pleased you came, so pleased that you shared that message with us. And Eugene's been very gracious uh, in giving us the chance to kind of ask back and feedback uh, what we've heard. And I'm um, just going to give you a couple of minutes um, just to articulate a question with someone near you. It could be someone that voted for a different party to you, because uh, you know that now. Um, this is a great networking event. Obviously, people are here who care about justice, so uh, maybe break out of your group by talking to someone behind you or in front of you. But uh, let's articulate a question, and then we'll invite Eugene up, and we'll uh, get some of those answers. So just a couple of minutes to articulate a question with a friend uh, or a stranger. Have a go for a few moments. Okay, I'm going to come to you. If you've got a, a question, raise your hand and um, get in there first. Oh, yeah, someone here? You should introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Maddie. Thank you so much for sharing this evening. It's been yeah, brilliant to hear. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Um, from someone who I so get where you're coming from, it's something very, very close to my heart. And... I think my question for you is how, how do you safeguard yourself from getting burnt out? Because I work for a, a Christian homeless charity and it's mm -hmm. the stories that I hear sometimes are very traumatic and I have to guard myself against that. And I wondered stuff that you've come across and the stories that you shared this evening yeah. can be quite exhausting, quite traumatic. How do you look after yourself and your family in that? That's a great question. Uh, a couple things pop to mind. One of the things that I wrestle with is what I call the messianic complex. 
And I think a lot of Christians, particularly those who are inclined towards wanting to change circumstances, wanting to engage in justice work, there's some of that within us. And I think that's one of the greatest dangers, actually, of doing justice work, is either we'll get burnt out or we have this messianic complex, and actually they're connected in some ways. So a couple things come to mind. One is just to name it. I think it's so important for us as followers of Christ to name the pit holes, to name some of the dangers that might lurk for us. So as we name it, we're more thoughtful about how we can pray about it, combat it, get accountability. A couple of those things for me is I, I, I realize how important, this isn't rocket science, reading the scriptures and praying, Sabbathing is so important. Uh, I mean, if there's one thing that I hope Christians can be religious about, I think it is Sabbath and rest, especially because we're so inclined towards work and wanting to change and fix things. So my wife, who's a therapist, she has basically diagnosed me and said, you will probably be, for the rest of your life, a recovering workaholic. And so I have to work against it in some ways. The other thing is community. You know, whether it's justice work or anything, is that because it is so tiresome, it can be so difficult. My fear for someone like you, I don't know you at all, Maddie, but even for myself, would be that we would grow hardened and cynical after a while. It's because you see so much. And this is why we have to realize this is a marathon. And if it's a marathon and we know it's a marathon, you're going to run that race a little bit differently. You just have to. Or you'll exhaust yourself after the first mile or two. What impresses me the most, if I can be blunt, isn't people like you and myself, to be honest. I just met with one of my mentors. He's just turning 80. He's still traveling the world. He's still investing in missionaries. He's still preaching the gospel. That's impressive, but what impresses me the most is that he still has joy in his heart. And I think that's a big danger. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Eugene. Who's got a next question? Put your hand up. Uh, okay, I'll come here and then I'll come to you. Introduce yourself, please. Hi there, I'm Alex. Uh, I do a degree in global development studies and have nothing to do with theology, uh, but I'm a Christian. Um, I was interested to know, so you, you, you talked a lot about how we, uh, how we approach people and that we are to address people not as projects, but as yeah. the image of God. Um, in order to do that and to do that successfully and to do that well, to transform people's lives, and yeah. as you said in your video, to, to, to lift people out of poverty, yeah. how do you do that without changing yeah. broader global structures which yeah. cause poverty rather than individual situations? That's right. It's a great question. Uh, that question is brilliant. It's important. I think the, the difficulty is in suggesting that we have to look at people. I'm not suggesting that we can't do important and healthy projects. We have to, like you said, you need to engage systemic structures, you need to engage governments, you need to engage corruption, and so these larger projects need to be engaged in. And that's what we do at One Day's Wages in partnership with many, many people. The danger for me, and I can only speak for friends that I know who do development work, is after a while, you hide behind development projects. That's what you do. You lose connection with the actual people that you're serving. It's amazing to me. For me as a pastor, one of the greatest dangers for me is if people only know me behind this pulpit. If this is something that I hide behind, and if I'm not knowing the people that I serve, I would say I lose the heart of what it means to be a shepherd to people. I think it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who once said, a pastor who no longer prays for his church is no longer a pastor. We're basically someone that just is a figurehead, if you will. So I would absolutely agree with you. We actually need to really be that much more vigilant about healthy projects and systems and structural changes but I hope that we're never those people who function in these ivory towers of development and have absolute no connection to the people that we serve. And from my vantage point, that's what I see sometimes. Great. Great question, Alex. I know someone that can help you with your theology if you want to <laughs> get studying. I think there's a question over here. You want to good. introduce He's yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Francesca. Um, my question was just about um, how you gave away uh, a year, a year's salary. Um, and I guess I was just wondering, um, 
people. What surprised you in that process of kind of preparing to give that money away, but also what the legacy of it has been um, in your family and whether things that you kind of expected were going to be hard and other yeah. things that really surprised you, that impacted you through that? Yeah. It's a great question. You know what surprised me is how, I think, how seductive money can be in all of our lives. And I know as a pastor, I'm not supposed to say that, but it is a seductive, seductive thing. And um, that just surprised me how difficult it was to let go of things. That oftentimes it's the stuff in our life that we allow to take hold and possess us in some way. To give you an example, you know, I, I had to sell my midlife crisis car. Uh, I had a 1991 blue Mazda Miata that I bought when I turned around 38 or 39. Uh, I loved that car. I called, it, I called it Blue Thunder, and I, I literally did call it Blue Thunder. And I knew, I was so convicted, I needed to let go of that car. And it was a family decision for our children. Uh, soccer camps, piano lessons all came to a halt. I'm so grateful that they're not piano prodigies. And uh, shopping basically for only basic essentials became our mantra for about three years. But I just realized it felt like a cleanse in some ways to kind of let go of these things. And that was really hard. I didn't expect it to be that difficult. But I did have a moment. Uh, it was uh, after that uh, story that Chris shared, I was staying at the sofas of people at our church. We went couch surfing. And that was humbling and difficult. But there was this one moment that I will never forget. Uh, we were staying at a, a congregant's home. Uh, they had a small living room, and so all of us were kind of perched on their living room. And we had our sleeping bags. Everybody had one, one luggage that they took with their toys, gifts, all that kind of stuff. And I remember just feeling the Holy Spirit prompt me to just look up and as I looked up, we were playing a game of like Scrabble or Monopoly. It was our family, it was my wife and our kids. We were playing this game. There was joy. And I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, you know, Eugene, everything that you need is right here. And we live in a large home, actually. We live in a home that's about 2,500 square feet. And oftentimes, our children were all in different places places in their respective rooms and their gadgets and I think to myself how easy it is to be so disconnected in a already increasingly disconnected world and I'll tell you that experience was was an amazing experience I'll never it was hard I'll never um, disown it because it really deepened our marriage it deepened our relationship with our children and I guess that would be the answer to the question about legacy is that we're learning continuously what it means to not hide behind the stuff that we sometimes get bogged under. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, just before uh, we close our evening together, um, I need to announce some winners. Um, I have two winners. Jake Wakefield, you have been um, prodigious. In fact, I don't know how your thumbs are still connected to your hands. Uh, in Twittering. So uh, if you want to come out, we have a little uh, prize for you. Yes. Well done, mate. Very good. And uh, Kemi, I think you had a, a great quote that you used earlier. Where are you? Good, good. Come out the front, Kemi. Um, so I liked your tweet. Healthy theology impacts the streets and not just our churches. It's truly incarnational. So we'd like to give you a little book. Oh, you have my book. There you go. Um, so well done. Great tweeting. Keep it going. Um, we have a limited copy, a uh, number of copies of Eugene's book, Overrated, and um, they are half price, which is pretty impressive. Uh, there are not many of them in the UK, so you could be amongst the first to kind of own one, and you can buy one on the way out. But um, I think we're going to do two things. One is uh, we're going to give Eugene one final round of applause to say thank you. And uh, I think it would be great if Josh would just lead us in a last song to kind of uh, close out our evening. Is that possible, Josh? Sure, let's do it. Great. Stand up if you're able, and uh, we'll close in worship. Since the king to 
You're the name above all names. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of our praise. And my heart will sing how great is our You're the name above all. You're so worthy. You are worthy of our praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. And how great. Our God, sing with me how great is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Sing one more time to clear it out. How great is our God, and how great. Father, you are a great God, and you deserve more from us than just songs, just noisy ego music. Lord, we know what you want. You want justice and oceans of it. You want fairness and rivers of it. And Lord, would we play our part in bringing you that kind of worship, the worship that you deserve. Father, thank you for what we've heard tonight. Thank you for Eugene being amongst us. Lord, would we do with it? as uh, you would have us do with it. Would you let these not just be words that ring in our ears, but would they transform our hearts and minds? Would our lives be lives lived of justice for your glory? 
Send us out into your world, in your spirit's power, for the name of your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the Day Gloria Trust for making this possible. Uh, please mill around downstairs and uh, buy books, mosey around through the, uh, the leaflets, and uh, may God bless you. Thank you.